for joining us uh, today. Um, should be a pretty interesting and exciting uh, few minutes here. Uh, Mark Hornbeek uh, will be joining us uh, by video. Um, uh, Mark uh, was in a hospital when we recorded this the other day, uh, and you'll uh, you'll probably get a sense of that. Uh, he's recovering from COVID, but being such a trooper, he he really wanted to make sure that uh, we stuck to the time schedule and uh, and got this done. So uh, we certainly uh, thank him for that. Uh, so Mark will kick us off. Uh, we're, he and I have an interesting conversation about where you might go to find uh, hidden uh, data delays, hidden hidden delays in the overall pipeline. <clears throat> then we're going to bring in Barack, and Barack's going to talk to us about how data in the data services layer itself can actually be a tool for platform engineers, DevOps engineers, and and others. Uh, to speed the process of CI/CD uh, pipelines, um, I know we've spent a lot of time and energy uh, accelerating CI/CD pipe and getting all of the burrs and friction out of it that we can. Uh, but we've discovered this new kind of layer underneath the ground, if you will, uh, that is slowing things down and has, I guess, sort of been always accepted as just a constraint of the environment. And that's the data layer. Um, we're spending a lot of time waiting for data to be moved, uh, to be reset after destructive testing, uh, to be pulled off of production and uh, uh, made available for testing in the process. And uh, we think we can really speed up the overall process by focusing more on that, on the layers of data and data services underlying the pipeline. So Barack will uh, take us through a demonstration and show you how that uh, specifically plays out and works. But let's get started today with uh, with the conversation that I had uh, Friday afternoon um, with Mark in a Mexican hospital. Um, thankfully, he is just fine, so uh, nothing to worry about there. But um, we'll start with that conversation. And then you can come here. All right. Well, uh, let me introduce Mark Hornbeek. Um, Mark and I have been developing relationship through uh, through Zoom and through uh, email messages uh, over the last few weeks. Um, Mark is joining us on videotape because at the last minute, Mark got COVID. Not, not unlike many of us, I suppose, in this time, uh, but he has soldiered on and uh, agreed to do the broadcast with us, but uh, he is in Mexico um recovering from COVID. so um hello mark hey i really appreciate the opportunity despite the challenges here uh i, I really well we're thrilled uh, to have you we're thrilled to have you with us um just by way of background let me tell you if you don't know mark you really probably should um mark is uh, fairly well known uh, having written the book Engineering DevOps, he's uh, known as the uh, DevOps the Gray, uh, although after COVID it might be DevOps the White pretty soon. Yes, I think. maybe. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Uh, but anyway, he is a recognized expert on DevOps, DevOps processes, and uh, who better to help us sort of understand how uh, the data layer and data itself affects uh, uh, the CI/CD pipeline and, and DevOps in general. So we're really, really excited about having Mark here. Um, so Mark, let me, let me let's start out with this um, sort of a general question. Uh, let's talk about the key issues that are affecting DevOps as related to storage. How how does storage and DevOps sort of intersect? Yeah. So certainly. A lot of people think about DevOps, continuous delivery and pipelines, and they're mostly talking about the application code. But of course, the application code doesn't really have a whole lot of meaning without data. <laughs> and DevOps is all about trying to accelerate continuous delivery, eliminate bottlenecks along the lines of the concepts of lean engineering, lean manufacturing applied to the software development and delivery process. One of the largest bottlenecks in the whole continuous delivery process for DevOps is setting up testing data 
and having data available. It's not just a matter of having data available, you know, one time. The pipeline is in fact a pipeline. So there's a series of stages starting typically with development prior to continuous integration, which is often not talked about all that well. And the developers struggle to get the right data. You wanna be testing with data that is realistic as much as possible. Um, so having a database with good data to perform good testing and development prior to integration is really important. And it's often hard to get that in a lot of big organizations where the people responsible for the data are separated from the applications people. And then once you get into the integration phase, which is typically very automated these days with continuous integration, you still have testing to do and you want to test with realistic data. You wanna be able to bring in the most current possible realistic production like data during the, even the integration phase. So there's yet another bottleneck potentially if you don't have a good connection between your data pipeline and your data capabilities, if it's not well integrated. And of course, after integration, you're really just producing artifacts that are candidates to be released in what's called pre-production, the staging environment. Some people call it the continuous delivery phase prior to deployment. Again, the same thing, you need data. You need current data, you need data that's relevant and uh, you want it to be reliable. If there are problems, you wanna be able to back up very quickly to different revisions of the data to match the revisions of the pipeline artifacts that are, you know, that, that, that you're having to work with at any point in time, depending on the challenges. And this is going on not just once for any one application. Any one application may have many developers, all of them trying to work in parallel. Um, and finally, producing the production data and having data available to deploy, being able to back up and restore things when, when things go wrong. So these are all just examples of you know, some of the challenges, uh, having the right data when needed, uh, having to wait often long periods of time to get that data from whatever the sources are, mm -hmm. having to be able to coordinate development data with other people and um, being able to resolve issues quickly. Often there's a lack of automation going on between the, you know, the, the continuous delivery application pipelines and the processes for data. So these are very serious concerns that are slowing down many enterprises and other organizations that are really trying to leverage DevOps mm -hmm. as part of their digital transformation. Wow, that's that's helpful. Thanks. Um, I think you you know you you often hear about the developers sort of don't don't know don't have an interest in you know where it comes from, right? I just I just want just give me the data, right? It's, I plug into it. I don't know, it comes out of the yeah. wall or something. I don't know what happens on the other side of the plug, but there's just yeah. supposed <laughs> to be data there, right? And it's not exactly. it's never quite that that simple. Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk about some of the um, uh, the the impacts of of all this data orchestration on the the process. Yeah, so I'm not you know I'm a consultant. I work with a lot of different firms, um, a lot of the different companies I work with, and our large organizations also, uh, you know, uh, government agencies and so on. And th there have been plenty of reports written that I can say from my own experience seem to be correct. <laughs> that, mm -hmm. um, you know, whether it's a large insurance company trying to put up a policy app with all the different uh, kinds of data that's needed for that. I work with a large global nutrition company that has an agent database with all their, you know, agents. Um, I work with a large global storage company as well. Mm -hmm. And I also work with some military organizations. They all share some similar problems when it comes to data. And the, this state of the DevOps report from Redgate is just one example of a report that echoes what I see in real life with a lot of real life use cases. Um, fundamentally, it's all about getting data quickly. 
in order to keep up the pipeline. The whole point of DevOps is to be able to deliver things quickly through a continuous delivery pipeline. But if you don't have the data to go with it, it's going to bottleneck things and slow it down. I do a lot of value stream management sessions, and quite often, you know, the, the number one um, bottleneck has to do with data, and especially data related to testing, and being able to recover that when there are problems as well. This is tying up a lot of time for the developers that need to be able to do other work. Um, and downtime also can be seriously affected. You really don't want your pipeline to be down. Once you get into DevOps in a you know, higher level of performance, you're depending on that pipeline to be working very consistently mm -hmm. and constantly. And if there's downtime, it doesn't just affect maybe one developer. I've seen it affect thousands of developers where they're literally waiting to see that pipeline come back up and running again, things of that nature. It's getting especially more important as things get more sophisticated when you have microservices and an application or a service that's built out of many services so that every one of those pipelines actually has to have some level of coordination, like a federated set of pipelines and each of them have data concerns as well. So this data issue really, you know, it needs to be much more integrated along the lines of how we deal with applications than they are today. Uh, I think a lot of the application type problems are being solved with tools like Kubernetes and being able to stand up infrastructure and so on. But the data side really needs some better solutions. I think I uh, I read last week there was one of the one of the industry, the, uh, the larger industry analyst uh, firms was talking about um, developer, how much developer time is spent on non-development activities, in, essentially infrastructure, you know, trying to find data, yes. get data, manage data, figure out what mm -hmm. to do with data. Um, and it was, it was extraordinary. It was 40% or something of their time is related to non, you know, not what we're paying you to do, right? Uh, it's all this other stuff in order to uh, to be effective. So certainly, oh, it's very very true. You know, people go to engineering school thinking they're going to be spending all day designing new things, but then you find out that in the real world, it's a lot of these more practical issues that you have to deal with. Yeah, and certainly, yeah, I describe them as plumbing problems. <laughs> yes, <laughs> well, that's why some engineers are in Canada. They call engineers plumbers. I think that may be the reason. <laughs> Well, listen, speaking about applications, let, let, let's talk about how traditionally data infrastructure and data orchestration has, has been integrated into the pipeline process. Uh, maybe, so just, maybe there's some, something here which is leading us to why these problems are, are occurring. There are, this is just one diagram out of my book um, in the section that I'm talking about data storage and data and, and DevOps, but uh, one of these approaches that people have taken to solve, if you like, the data problem is if you're thinking about an application, it typically has more than just one pipeline, even a relatively simple three-tier application. Forget about microservices for the moment, but even just a relatively short um, application like that. The, often they're, they're, they're dealing with it by setting up a separate parallel data CI CD pipeline. There are a number of tools out there that can help you do that. Mm -hmm. But then you have to coordinate between these different pipelines and the coordination is particularly challenging. You know, how do you um, make sure that you got the right data at the right time for each of these different pipelines? Hmm. Um. I guess I didn't know that there was this potential for a possibility for a separate CICD pipeline just for data. So that's uh, something I'll have to go learn more about myself. But th thank you, I appreciate it. Yeah. But it definitely it, it definitely appears that, to me anyway, that you know the, the problem of having data external and not integrated into the rest of the toolkit. Um, is certainly contributing to this, you know, sort of overall uh, friction, uh, data-related friction. Um, let's let's talk about pain points. Uh, uh, what what do you see as kind of the um, the key pain points that that are going to drive uh, our listeners to want to go 
uh, find a better way to manage data in the uh, in the CI/CD DevOps world. Yeah, so there are plenty of pain points. I've mentioned some of them already. The, probably the biggest one is to be able to have good data available for each of the pipeline stages mm -hmm. when you need it. And bearing in mind, again, there's typically multiple pipelines. So there's multiple places where you need data. Um, if you have too many instances of data, now you've got inefficiencies. If you have to replicate data all over the place for each of the different stages of all these different pipelines. So that's a major pay point. You really want to be able to pool the data together somehow in a better way. And also just getting access, you know, if you've got all of these different sources um, that are slow to access because of lack of automation, lack of integration with the different data tools and the pipeline tools, this can cause bottlenecks at for an individual pipeline, but also for an entire release that may consist of multiple pipelines. In general, it's, a, you know, when you do have a problem, which of course problems occur, otherwise you wouldn't be doing any work if they always worked. So the long, it's a long, you know, long time to restore services and data, all of these things. Yes. Okay. All right, great. Um, well, we're, uh, we're, Coming down on time, let me just ask you uh, sort of the, the final couple questions here. What, if you're going to, you know, whiteboard a solution for us, um, mm -hmm. you know, what does it, what does it start to look like? What, how do we get out of this mess? Right. So the pipelines themselves, I don't think are going to change that much over some time. You're still going to have dev tests, continuous integration reproduction with continuous delivery and production. Those major, major steps are fairly you know, common and they're not gonna go away from an application point of view. What's needed is to have better integration with data and not to have to have it as a, you know, a separate entity. It needs to be more integrated with that pipeline. So uh, Kubernetes has proven to be an excellent approach for orchestrating containers. So containerizing data using tools like Kubernetes that, you know, to, to, to really integrate data into the, into the pipeline as a more integral capability so that you can treat data just as if, if it's in other artifacts that are being treated as part of the pipeline. For that to happen, there needs to be some kind of platform where the data volumes, you know, can be managed as a pool for efficiency purposes and be able to be able to call, you know, called up eph ephemerally as needed and um, being able to share data very quickly across different volumes because, you know, one, one volume may be more up to date and you need access to that latest volume very quickly. Uh, at the same time, abstracted all from physical stories these days, pretty much all the work is being done in a distributed remote manner. So this you know, platform needs to be capable of serving across a very widely distributed, very efficient um, you know, pool, effectively manage the whole set of data as a pool mm -hmm. that can be called up on demand as required, no matter where you are in the development organization or in the testing or production organization. Uh, I agree, and uh, we also have to keep keep in mind that that uh, this is a geographically distributed problem too right because the developers yes. are no longer in one place so exactly make the data where it needs you know available where it's needed when it's needed um yes. okay one last question so for our listeners where do they start how do they how do they where do you put the spade into to start start digging into this problem you know, as a consultant, I deal with a lot of different firms. They often ask me the same question. They're often coming because they have started already and they failed <laughs> and they weren't really sure, you know, that they're not getting the results that they thought they would. Mm -hmm. I have what I call a seven step transformation process that I strongly recommend. It's very simple. You can apply it to anything, including DevOps. <laughs> you start with leadership. You start by getting a common vision. You have to get the leaders on board to say, yeah, we do need a solution and we need a really good solution. 
what are the overall values that we're trying to accomplish with our DevOps pipelines? How can we, you know, what are the major goals, the major tactics? What are the major technology choices that should be made? That's step one. Step two is more what I call team alignment, where, the, where these senior leaders get their reports to agree as to what the more specific goals are. Don't try to boil the ocean. Don't try to do everything at once. Set out with some realistic goals for the first one or two legs in the journey. Of course, I'm biased. I am a consultant, so I always recommend bringing in somebody that's done this a few times before. Step three is something I call the assessment stage, where you do a very thorough current assessment. It's a current state discovery, which involves survey tools, online discovery tools, and value stream management and gap analysis to really do a thorough understanding of where are you now with your set of issues. That will lead you to what I would call a future state value stream where you would then map out, you know, what are the right components for the solution in this case, what are the right people and process and technology components that need to go together to make up the solution. Once you have a recommended solution, you then implement an MVP of that solution, instrument it, validate that it's working well, and then you can start doing what I call operationalize it, expand it, and finally expand across you know, the organization. This is not a small journey. DevOps doesn't happen by just buying a tool. Mm -hmm. These things take time and they do take investment. The good news is when the investments are made, it's been proven time and time and time again, not just by the unicorns. If you look at the, you know, the Dora state of the DevOps reports and others, um, the results are remarkable. You know, you don't, you don't get a few percent improvement. You get a thousand percent improvement, wow. but it does take a very strategic approach and a stepwise careful approach if you really want to succeed without having too many, you know, going forward and then going backwards. That's my recommendation. Great. Well, listen, I think that's very, very helpful. Uh, really appreciate your uh, coming out of uh, your recovery to uh, to spend a few minutes with us. We'll let you get back to your oxygen tank. <laughs> you, you're, and, you're not, uh, you, 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 I have to tell you a story. While we were talking, mm -hmm. there's a nurse in front of me saying, I only have two more minutes and I need to <laughs> get back on the oxygen. Oh, my yes. God. Well, <laughs> you're a trooper and a half. I'll tell you that. And I really appreciate it. I'm sure the listeners do as well. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you for uh, the opportunity. I really yeah. enjoy this topic, and I think that I wish you all the best and success with everybody. Great. I'm sure have, uh, this data problem will be is is solvable, and I, I have a feeling you guys have a good solution. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Okay. Take care. Bye now. The um, for the sake of time, let's throw it over to uh, Barack at this point. Um, and uh, he's going to take us through uh, a little bit of a demonstration of how um, we might build such a uh, Kubernetes container native uh, storage platform. So uh, Brock, I'll uh, stop sharing and if you could jump in and let's go uh, from sure. your side. Sure, thanks, Kirby. I'm gonna share my screen quickly. Uh, just a second. Okay. So thank you. Thank you everyone uh, for joining today. So uh, I'm Barak Sim. I'm uh, part of the INEA team. Um, and I'm gonna walk you through uh, a quick intro about what is INEA and how we are, uh, um, uh, what's our role in, in this kind of DevOps clouds, let's call it, or DevOps environments. Um, and I have lined up uh, two um, basic demos to show you our capabilities and how we can accelerate uh, your data operations in your uh, DevOps uh, pipelines. So let's start with a quick, very quick introduction. So what is INEAR? So um, INEAR is a Kubernetes native storage 
solutions. So that means that we are operated and installed, let's call it, or provisioned on top of your Kubernetes cluster. We are not an external uh, entity to the, your Kubernetes environment. So we are um, uh, at the physical point, let's call it, we are aggregating and pulling all your physical storage devices. Um, and we are uh, uh, presenting that to your applications and to your pods running on top of Kubernetes. Um, and we are not just doing that in a basic way. So we are microservices uh, based. So our solution is very uh, native to Kubernetes. So we are uh, uh, um, using all the capabilities of uh, agility and elasticity on top of Kubernetes. And we are uh, just like any other application that is hosted in your Kubernetes clusters. And of course, we are providing storage and in a form of persistent volumes uh, um, for your applications running on top of Kubernetes. And we are uh, introducing as part of it a lot of enterprise capabilities uh, that used to be you know, uh, the world outside of Kubernetes in the past, but we are bringing uh, them into your persistent volume environment. So. Uh, capabilities like deduplication and compression are all in line as part of our solution. Uh, we, uh, we have a unique solution that is um, um, labeling, uh, let's say, uh, uh, for any IO operations that you have in the environment, also a timestamp. So we can actually revert and go back and create clones from the past, which is very important for the use case that uh, was mentioned on the video about going back to uh, um, you know, uh, a specific point in time in your DevOps environment that you knew was operating, working well. And of course, uh, another big uh, um, and important capability uh, um, is about moving or, you know, uh, um, accessing data across clouds. So uh, our, we have two main capabilities. One is the uh, move data across time that I mentioned before, which means that we're actually uh, giving you the tools to uh, um, simulate or let's say clone your environment to any specific point in time that you decide. Um, and the second capability is move data across space. So no matter where your persistent volume uh, runs or exists, uh, it can be private cloud or public cloud, it can be uh, um, uh, um, in your environment or not. And then we can uh, uh, teleport, this is our capability that we call uh, of moving persistent volume and persistent uh, uh, volumes between Kubernetes clusters in under 40 seconds. So no matter uh, um, where your cloud is or no matter where is your uh, uh, deployment of Kubernetes uh, uh, and no matter also the size of the persistent volume that you're running in under 40 seconds, we can bring that anywhere, anywhere in your Kubernetes uh, environment. So Kubernetes is the platform for the uh, you know, hybrid cloud and multi-cloud, we're seeing that more and more with customers. Uh, and this is, uh, um, um, you know, making data as agile as your application. So we know it's very easy to provision uh, applications on Kubernetes, um, but data is still not addressed in a very uh, agile way. And this is exactly what we are uh, uh, aiming at uh, in IMU. So we have, um, these two capabilities. And uh, this is just uh, uh, to, sh to show you um, a basic, or let's say a, a, um, a common way of we see cus uh, how we see customers running their pipelines. Uh, you, you might recognize that from your environment or not specific stages here and there, or uh, you might be doing continuous delivery. So you don't have, uh, uh, and you, you do have the staging, maybe you're not, but in essence, this is, uh, um, uh, to just, uh, depict your environment in means of, uh, um, let's say it could be different Kubernetes clusters, it could be different namespace in the same Kubernetes cluster, uh, and it can be uh, uh, across your uh, maybe private cloud and uh, public cloud as well. So uh, the arrows that we see this is, or the left side of the, of the slide is what we see uh, without introducing data as part of your pipeline. This takes hours to copy databases or you know, move uh, a code around or, or artifacts around your pipeline. Uh, and what you see in the right side is actually uh, a pipeline that is optimized by INES. So using our capabilities of cloning and cloning back in time and teleporting volumes between, between clusters, uh, we are actually 
um, cutting any time that you have in your pipeline that is related to data weight in means of copies or moving data between environments. So we move that to 40 seconds or less. Um, so this is the high level of, of the stages themselves. And this is uh, what we're gonna um, show in the demo in just a few seconds. Uh, so on the left side, you can see the first basic demo that we have lined up is actually using uh, Jenkins inside uh, a Kubernetes environment and using our APIs and our storage system to rapidly clone uh, uh, our, uh, um, uh, uh, let's call it build environment and create a, a multiple pods or multiple environments to build and test in parallel uh, uh, that specific code or project. And this can be, you know, dependent on your uh, uh, environment and dependent on your project, uh, um, the impact is, is, is very great. Um, so that's the first demo that we'll do in a second. And the second one uh, I'll do right after that is uh, um, relating to what we discussed before, which is introducing uh, um, a production data uh, uh, between uh, Kubernetes clusters. This is actually using our teleport capabilities. So we will teleport a Mongo volume uh, from our production environment to our dev and test cloud, uh, which will run queries on, and you'll see that it's you know under 40 seconds. Uh, you will get you will get the uh, uh, um, um, the uh, uh, um, production data up to the point that we started the teleport. So uh, that will be um, inside that. But just before uh, I'm gonna start this one, um, Kirby, can you start the, the um, maybe the poll? I just wanna you know, ask around people. Um, ah, I can start it myself, sorry. So I'm gonna launch the poll, take a few seconds to answer that, just quick three seconds uh, to understand you know, your environment today, what we have your, um, in your data center today, and uh, I'll use the time to switch between displays. So I'm launching it now. I'm gonna give it a few more seconds. I'll let it get to about a minute of giving people some time to answer the questions. Perfect, looks good. I'm gonna end the poll in a couple more seconds. Perfect. Thank you very much to everyone that answered. Um, so um, we can see that some of you are using Kubernetes for your uh, DevOps environment, some not, uh, for your Jenkins environment. And we see that a lot of you have uh, described that you have problems with data weight and you're mostly using private cloud, which is uh, very similar to what we see with our customers as well. So I'm gonna start the demo. I'm gonna run uh, quickly across the two um, scenarios that I mentioned before. Uh, um, hopefully we'll have enough time for questions afterwards and I'll try to give you all the answers. Um, so what you see in front of you, this is the Ioneer uh, UI which is actually managing two Kubernetes clusters um, um, that are deployed uh, specifically in, in cloud environment. So we can see we have our test cloud and we have our production cloud. Uh, in our test cloud, the only thing that we have running right now is our Jenkins workload, which has a couple of volumes uh, used for it. And in our production environment, we only have a MongoDB that is uh, running right now. It has a 10 gigabyte of a database. I'll show you that in a second uh, that has data in it. Um, uh, and these are our two clusters. Um, I'm gonna jump quickly to Jenkins. So probably most of you know this UI, so I'm not gonna explain too much what you're seeing, but we have our two use cases or our two concepts here. 
So um, this is the parallel build test demo that we have. And it will actually, what it will do, it has a first step as we saw in the, uh, uh, in the image, the first step of Git pooling uh, 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 a Git project that is about um, a gig in size, let's say. It can be even more than that, depends on your environment. And then it spins up three jobs that are using clones of that Git repo uh, and running their own test builds on different branches or different uh, um, components of your environment. And you'll see that you don't have, so usually what customers are doing, so each um, worker node is actually pulling his own environment or pulling his own set of code. But that is, you know, when it happens in parallel, you have bandwidth problems, you have different read and write operations that are colliding and so on and so on. Uh, and of course, most worker nodes are also ephemeral. So that's the best practice in Jenkins, you probably know that all. Um, uh, so you're losing that point uh, as part of your environment. So let's just quickly run this, uh, uh, this workload. I'm gonna jump into the, uh, um, um, into the output in a sec, but this is all parameterized. You can see this is just parameters for our internal uh, um, uh, product, which is actually all API based. Uh, we're shooting up some parameters to make it easy to uh, you know, jump between environments. Um, and we're gonna build this right now. I'm gonna jump to the history and we'll see what actually happened. So you'll see that we are creating uh, a pod on our Kubernetes environment that will get assigned uh, our persistent volume as we decided. And that will, in a second, uh, will uh, run the Git pool as we said. So while it's running and downloading and doing the Git fetch, I can show you our uh, Kubernetes cluster. So right now you'll see that we have two pods that are running at the Jenkins deployment itself and another pod that we created. And of course, uh, uh, you know, the PVC that I showed you before in IUI, and you can see that our clones are already created automatically in a few seconds. So if I'll jump back, you'll see that our uh, uh, API finished correctly and it's already running uh, our uh, um, downstream jobs. So these jobs, for example, Let's dive into, uh, let's say, uh, um, test job two. We can see its output and it's also creating a pod to, write, to run its own uh, um, um, test scenarios. This is specifically based on Java and Maven, uh, which is actually uh, doing some builds uh, uh, as part of it and running a specific test scenario that is defined uh, as part of this, uh, as part of this build, um, yeah, and this is creating the the pods. Now it will start to run the Maven flow. So you can see in the background, this is our cluster. And now you can see that we have multiple test pods that have been spinned up by our job, and they're all sharing the same. Uh, content that is came from the, this PVC, which is our Git pool PVC. And we create clone based on our uh, uh, definition. So we created three clones. You can create 100 clones. You can have even more than that. And what's important to know that we are 100% uh, inline DDU. So it means that you are not paying on storage. You're not paying on, you know, uh, on any resources in your environment. So everything is, of course, thinly provisioned and is 100% did So the, the impact of having five clones or 10 clones or 100 clones is minimal and it's, it's up to zero. So the only the Delta is actually um, uh, making an impact on your storage layer, let's call. Um, so we can see that this build has finished in success. So you can see it has a few uh, uh, test scenarios uh, and uh, it gave us a success as part of the end of the build. So if we'll, we'll go back um, to our uh, main job, which is our um, the Git pool piece, we can see that um, uh, for now, uh, um, the, I'm sorry. So the latest build is, is done, uh, is finished successfully. We've created three pods, the three jobs has finished successfully. And what's nice about it that now 
uh, in this configuration and in this, in this setup, we still have those um, clones ready to use. So if I'll spin this up again, we can, we can connect to the same uh, um, to the same PVCs, the same volumes have the same content. And if we have a broken bill, we can revert that back to any point in time that we would like and run the, the job again and with a different setup, with a different set of uh, you know, test tools and so on um, and, and, and get uh, the, the best result that we need. And you, we, of course, you can decide if you wanna clean this, if you wanna keep it up. So it's all based on your uh, um, decision and your environment. Okay, so that was the uh, build and test scenario. Um, and our second scenario is, is a little bit similar to a point. So we have one uh, upstream job, let's call it, that calls three downstream jobs. And instead of do doing a build or instead of doing a, a, a test scenario, what we're actually doing is teleporting a volume from our production cluster to our test and dev environment. And of course it's under 40 seconds. So uh, uh, you will see that, that we have a MongoDB, I'll show you that in a second. Uh, you see we have a MongoDB for each, uh, for each job and it's running a CLI pod and it's something that is very cool and very sleek uh, um, uh, to show while it's running. So I'm gonna run the same concept. The only thing that is changed from our previous deployment parameters is the fact that we are talking to a remote Kubernetes cluster now to bring the PVC to our test cluster. So I'm gonna uh, run this job. Let's look at what it does. So potentially uh, um, you will see again, our environment is, is pretty clean right now, right? We only have a teleporter pod that we have created. This pod is just running our APIs to make sure we are bringing the right, uh, um, um, the right PVC from, from the target. And you can see that it's running and it's gotten us three volumes per job, right? So we have, uh, what I created in my setup is I created the namespace for each uh, job that we have. And you'll see that each namespace will have our uh, PVC in it. So if I go back here, you can see our namespaces. So we have a namespace per job, right? Let's jump into one of the namespaces. And we can see there's nothing here yet, but our PVC is already here. So as I said, this is our target cluster. So if I'll, um, you'll see that I have my MongoDB in my production environment. Let me just jump into that. So you can see, um, you can see the production dat database, perfect. This is our Mongo. DB that has 11 gigabytes in size, right? So uh, of course I can run a query here. I'm sorry. And you'll see they have some answers here from the database. So this is, we'll use that to show you uh, that it actually traveled across space uh, in, in these under 40 seconds. So if you go back to our production environment, so our test uh, cloud, sorry. So we see already have a Mongo pod here and a pod for our test job that is actually already running. So let's jump back. Um, let's jump back to our environment and we see that the three downstream jobs are already running. We can jump into one of it and see what's actually running in that scenario. So you see we have the telepod that has happened here and actually we created the MongoDB uh, to catch that PVC in from the production database. And we're running the Mongo query, similar to what I ran in the production. And you can see that we're getting the same results. So uh, I can put it even side by side. And this is our production database. And this is our test environment, right? So we are getting results in the live uh, uh, build as well. So this is finished with success. Of course, you can make this uh, um, um, very complex and run different uh, uh, scenarios. Just use something very, very, very basic to show you the capabilities 
of, uh, um, of Ioneer that brings you production data to your um, cloud. And of course, this is the view of our uh, test cloud. You can see we have a lot of volumes right now. Uh, actually, Teleport is still running in the background. Uh, if you're interested, I can spend a couple of minutes. We don't have too much time to explain about time. the Teleport, but it, <laughs> yeah, but in essence, you can see that the volumes are already accessible and can be consumed by uh, our Mongo test pods, but actually we are teleporting uh, um, the data in the backend and making everything available for the application. So this is the magic of, of teleporting data between clusters. Great. Uh, all right, uh, Brock, just uh, for the sake of time, a couple, couple questions have come in. Um, one, uh, the clones that you're creating, when you do create those clones, um, you know, instantly creating them, uh, just, just to the point, they're completely independent, right? Uh, you can read and write to each yeah. one of them completely independently, right? Of course, of course. And, no and you can even delete, you can even delete the, the, the parent, which is something that not usually happens, you know, in different storage solutions. Uh, so there's no link between parent and child, and the child is completely independent. You can read, write, delete, uh, whatever uh, um, uh, you want in that setup. So essentially, each developer so gets, gets their own set of data uh, in 40 seconds. Exactly. They can do whatever they want to do with it, and it won't hurt anybody else or affect anyone else. Um, exactly. Ayman asks the question, for Kubernetes clusters, are you using a prod cluster or a mini cube? So... Our requirement is to be, we should be production because we are production storage. Uh, we do have a flavor coming up, which is a uh, uh, developer friendly, let's call it, where you can run that probably on Minikube or different low end, uh, um, uh, low end uh, uh, servers, let's call it. But you need to understand that Ioneer is a production grade storage system. So each volume uh, um, that you, uh, create is protected with multiple copies. Uh, and of course, uh, we have uh, erasure coding coming and, you know, everything is uh, aligned toward uh, uh, being fully production and fully, let's say, mature storage system. So this is not like an NFS or something that is very, you know, uh, uh, not stable, let's call it, or not performance. So we really, really uh, uh, insisted on creating a production line storage system. Great. Um, another question was um, differences between public and pr private. Um, the speed obviously is super quick here. You're dealing private. Uh, what happens in the public cloud? Does it work same speed, same, same, same way? So yeah, that, that's, that's, exactly, that's exactly it. So our proprietary, uh, you know, uh, um, IP based, patent based, solution is you're making sure that under 40 seconds, uh, you will get your volume wherever it is, you know, uh, um, in the world. And, and of course, uh, if it's private or public cloud, the same uh, promise, you know, holds. So we will bring you the, uh, uh, the volume to be accessible and used by the application under 40 seconds, yes. Okay, great. Um, if you will throw it back over to me, I'll close it up and uh, we're almost done. Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, wanted to uh, to thank Mark, uh, 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 even though he is uh, he's not with us, but he is with us in spirit and heart. Sorry about the technical difficulties there. Hopefully we got it cleaned up, um, and uh, we will when we store this for uh, reuse, we'll take care of the audio there. Uh, something happened with Zoom apparently, um, and I think we but I think we captured most of his points. Um, if you have any questions, we have a lot more information available at ioneer.com. Uh, you can also uh, grab yourself a free trial of the uh, Ioneer platform, which will do all the amazing things and more that uh, Barack just showed you. Uh, but it really does allow you to uh, condense and, and eliminate many of these data weight gaps uh, that, have, that we've identified in the pipeline. Um, also, uh, we'll just say if you have, um, any specific uh, requirements that you'd like us to uh, sort of take a look at as it looks as, as uh, it relates to these pipelines. Uh, Brock has kindly offered his own personal time uh, to take a look uh, and, um, and see if he can help you identify some of these gaps 
uh, and show you how we might eliminate them. Um, so uh, please, uh, you can uh, get a hold of us at the Contact Us free uh, Kubernetes trial. Let us know that you're interested in, in having Brock take a look and we can do that. Um, but overall, thank you very much for joining the podcast. Again, thanks to Mark, Brock. Uh, I'm Kirby Wadsworth, uh, and uh, we really also want to thank the Linux Foundation for allowing us to share this information with you. Hopefully, it was helpful. Thank yes, you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kirby. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Barack, and thank you to all the attendees who joined us today. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation YouTube page later today, and we hope to see you back at a future webinar. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.